Hey all, today I have a fascinating discussion uh, with a certain Stephen Petty. And what makes him special is he's an expert, not just in PPE or personal protective equipment, but in the measurement and analysis of all kinds of exposure to pathogens or bacteria or Legionnaire's disease or asbestos uh, and everything to do with that field. He has a very successful company that deals with those matters. He's also an adjunct professor in, in related matters and he's a genuine bona fide expert and can judge the effectiveness of certain things like, for instance, masks uh, that there's been a lot of conversation about and a lot going on about that in the last couple of years and a lot of arguments and debates about the effectiveness of uh, said devices. So this guy, Stephen Petty, has personally been an expert witness in around 400 legal cases pertaining to these types of matters. He's also been involved in thousands of projects, again, in related type science and industrial safety, etc. So I'm delighted to have found this particular guy who is a true expert because we often hear doctors and other people commenting on the importance or not of these masks, but they're not experts in masks at all. Uh, they're medical experts, that's their expertise. But today we have Stephen Petty, who's a real expert in the actual technology we're talking about. Again, I'm very careful on this platform and some others. There's been uh, bizarre levels of censorship in the last couple of years, uh, but I'm delighted to bring you uncensorable content from real experts, real data, real political or congressional type environments. Um, and that uncensorable data is still fascinating. So I think for people who debate this topic of masks, this will be a really great resource. You can skip my intro here and tag it straight to where Stephen Petty goes through the actual data on mask effectiveness. Uh, I think it's a super resource. I'm going to be using it and I link to his podcast and his other links below so you can follow up on all the detailed discussions where he's actually showing and going through references as opposed to simply citing uh, today. Uh, so enjoy this and do use it as a resource when people are debating this particular topic uh, because you really should go to the bona fide experts when discussing these matters. So thank you. Here we go. First of all, I wanted to thank Melissa and the committee for the opportunity to talk. I've, pres I've given you some handouts. I'm going to rapidly go through those, but I'll touch on the high points um, because I know there's limited time. Um, again, my name is Stephen Petty. I'm a certified industrial hygienist, certified safety professional, uh, professional engineer, I've been working 45 years in the field of health and safety, spent my entire life trying to protect workers and the public from toxins. I've sampled for anthrax, biotoxins, the whole list. I've been in over 400 uh, cases named uh, with respect to exposure control and exposure and PPE. And um, most recently, I testified in the state of Kentucky, and as a result of my testimony, the mask mandate was overturned statewide. So let me introduce the topic of industrial hygiene. Industrial hygiene is not well understood by many. We have a lot of physicians talking about industrial hygiene. It's not their field. Industrial hygiene is a science and art devoted to anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of environmental factors and stressors that can cause you to be sick, make, make you uh, feel bad, or even kill you. And I've testified 400 times in those sorts of cases. The problem is that we have a lot of physicians talking about things like that, and they may be perfectly talented folks, but it's not their sandbox. When I'm in trials, we have a physician that talks about uh, the disease, and I talk about exposure and exposure control and PPE. The last, uh, the, the physician that talked earlier, I'm here to show you that every statement he made is false. Um, let me go then. There's really three ways you can look at why masks can and cannot work, and I'm on page three of my handouts, the top slide. Um, this is a plot of cases of COVID in New Hampshire with time. If you really believe that masks could work, you would expect the cases would drop with time. They do not. You can draw this plot for any state or any country in the world. 
what you see is where people are indoors more in the northern climates, the winter time, disease rates go up. That's a well understood industrial hygiene fact that, that's over 100 years old. And you see that in this plot. Um, now I want to move you on to um, the uh, epidemiology, and there are lots of studies, but at the bottom of page four, probably the one uh, that's uh, most relevant is the Bundegaard study out of Denmark. They looked at 6,000 or so folks, 3,000 with masks, 3,000 without masks. They found no difference in disease rate. Similar study was done on schools in Florida, same outcome, and that's on the bottom of page five. The, the reality is that uh, I testified in federal court in Michigan about the CDC studies and showed that almost all the studies they cited suffered from two flaws. One, they didn't have a control group, that is a group not wearing masks as similar to a group that was wearing masks to see what the differences were. If you don't have a control group, how do you know it makes a difference? The other thing is there were confounding factors where there were multiple things going on at the same time uh, with or without a control group like air conditioning cha uh, changes, uh, separation, quarantine, and masking. There's no way to know whether masking has any effect at all. The real solution has always been, for 50 years, engineering controls of ventilation, dilution, or destruction. And, and those solutions I've actually implemented in real schools beginning in 2020. And I work with many, many school districts to implement them. This isn't about a mask or a respirator. Those are the least desirable options. It's always about getting rid of the problem. Now let's look at this issue from a micro perspective real quickly. Uh, and again, I'm on the bottom of page seven. If you can see visible dust, it's on the order of 50 microns. That unit may or may not mean anything. The, the, the virus is 500 times smaller than what you can see. If you look at a cross section of a human hair, I've got a plot on the bottom of page seven. You see that dot. That dot is 10 times the size of a virus. It's a micron or so. So the, the COVID particle is a thousand times smaller than the cross section of human hair. And I ask everybody the simple question, you wear your mask, can you slip a human hair by the side of your mask? Of course you can, especially below the eyes. It's a super freeway for the virus to come and go. This source control argument is bogus. Source control means the person wearing the mask, somehow or other, those, those viruses can't escape the mask. That's just nonsense. If you've got this super freeway, it doesn't, the virus doesn't care where it's coming in or going out. A couple of things that need to be talked about real quickly. There's been great disinformation about um, COVID being a droplet. Now, particles can be classified in two bins, droplets and aerosols. The data I show on page eight shows that over 99.9% .9 of the particles are aerosols, less than five microns. They're not droplets, that's not the problem. The other thing that you see on the bottom is droplets fall to the ground very quickly. So, so even though they're a very small fraction, they'll fall to the ground on the order of minutes. If you look on the top of page nine though, and you look at aerosols, it takes up to 50 days for them to fall. So these things are suspended in the air for days and days. So there's no way you have a COVID meter on your chest or your head. The only way that you're gonna know if somebody's in aisle four and is sick the day before, you have no way of knowing whether that stuff's still there or not. So what's the solution? The solution is to dilute it with ventilation, filter it out, or destroy it. It always has been the solution. The National Safety Council gave us those solutions from an industrial hygiene standpoint in 1950, over 70 years ago. People talk about these masks. Why can masks not work? Bottom of page nine. The problem is you cannot seal a mask by definition. A, meal, a mask that seals is a respirator. I also want to talk a little bit, they say, well, um, I'm on, now on page 11, I want to whip through this. They say, well, they might do a little bit of good. Well, that is in our, in industrial hygiene, we don't look at solutions that do a little bit of good. It might, it might help 1% of the people. 
we have a requirement that if we're going to provide a solution that helps the public, it better have at least a 90% relative risk reduction. So how, how would you feel if I walked in and I said to asbestos workers, let's put you in a mask, it might save 1% of you from asbestosis, but the other 99% will get it. I think I would lose all my, all my licenses. And by the way, the asbestos fiber on average is 50 times larger than a COVID particle, and we have very high-end respirators, PAPRs, that are used to protect asbestos workers. And I'm certified in protecting asbestos workers. So why in the world would you take a 1% solution when you need 90% when we have solutions like ventilation destruction and filtration that do meet that 90% requirement from industrial hygiene? The other thing you hear about all the time is on page 12, you see the top. Well, let's move on to, to N95s. As I just said, we wouldn't even use an N95 for asbestos workers. But here's a study by Shaw et al. that shows even for an N95 where you glue it onto a board, and that's where most of these mask studies are done. They literally glue the mask onto a mannequin or a board. Now, do you glue your mask on your face? Of course not. So what happens when it's not, so if it's glued on, they say, well, it has 46% effectiveness. But what if you put a gap on it, 3% effectiveness? And that's the real world. So about masks, on to page 13. On January 2nd, 2022, Scott Gottlieb, FDA commissioner and Face the Nation spilled the beans. He said, basically, masks don't work. I've, I've been putting real engineering controls in real schools for two years. You can imagine as somebody who spent his whole life defending workers in toxic tort trials and the public, how infuriating it is to see people propose solutions that cannot and do not work. He admitted it. We also had CDC finally admit on January 14th of 2022, well, these masks aren't very effective, so let's move to N95s. I've said, no, 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 let's move to engineering controls. If you follow the CDC guidance, I said, what science changes its position 180 degrees in two years? Mass, no mass, mass, no mass. No science does that. The other thing I want to point out is on the bottom of page 15, and I wrote a 27-page letter to CDC in February complaining about this, as well as to Fauci in the White House, along with eight other industrial hygiene folks. They, they say, well, we want to put children in N95s, and then they link you to the manufacturer's websites, including 3M. What does 3M say about N95s in children? Not designated to be used by children. And also they say, well, well, as soon as you go to mass, you've got to start following respiratory protection standard, which has all sorts of requirements. You can't just hand somebody an N95 and not incur a lot of liability if you don't ensure that they're fit tested, that they're medically cleared to wear it, that they've been trained on how to wear it, and they've been trained on how to replace it. So uh, on the bottom of page 16, we have industrial hygiene, as I've said before, what we call the hierarchy of controls. Everybody agrees with this. The, the most effective hierarchy is engineering controls. The least effective would be personal protective equipment, or PPE. And PPE for respiratory protection is respirators, because you can seal respirators. Now, why are respirators on the bottom of the barrel for controlling hazards? Because they don't get worn right. You put somebody in, we know this from decades of doing this, you put, a, you put a respirator on somebody for eight hours a day, they're gonna break that seal. Guaranteed, it's not gonna get worn right. Well, the interesting thing is masks don't even fit in the hierarchy. They're below it. They're not even part of it. Again, engineering controls is the solution. Now, what about damage to children? There's lots and lots of data on this. Um, beginning on page 18, Curriculum Associates is showing um, both for reading and for mathematics in one year um, loss of performance of upwards of 12 to 15 percent, depending on the grade level. Um, and it's worse for minorities, as you see on page 19. 
Brown University put a study out for kids born during COVID wearing masks show a 23% reduction in learning. So what did CDC do on February 8th? They took the 18-year-old criteria for child development and they moved the goalpost. They didn't admit that this was causing enormous damage. They said, okay, the performance standards you have at 24 months, we're going to make 30 months. Sad. The, the, also, the uh, England Department of Education, I'm on the bottom of 20, um, noted that 94% of the teachers indicated that wearing face coverings has made communication more difficult, and 59% said much more difficult. Kuzlensky and their co-authors looked at 1,226 papers on masking, distilled it down to 109 qualitative and 49 quantitative, bottom of page 21, and they showed 27 adverse effects they could quantitate, including five specifically for children. So what's my answer and, and conclusion for all of you? Please put this in place. Masks have not ever been and cannot be a solution. Engineering controls of fresh air, filtration, destruction, have and always have, will be the best solutions. We don't have to worry, as the physician said earlier, about some future pandemic, because the right solutions will always be engineering controls. They have been for 80 years. Thank you. Questions? Senator Ravard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I'm just curious, is this all this information available on Google, and have you been uh, contacted by the media, whether Channel 9 or Fox News, to disperse this information because it seems to be new? Um, it, um, the answer is it's not new. I have given six national podcast statements that are online. Um, our presentations of this material beginning in 2020, after I did the school in Ohio with 750 autistic children. The um, material, I spent almost a half a million of my own time and money building a studio and putting out 20 podcasts, summarizing all this. Each podcast, any study I cite will have the URL or the reference to the material. It is true more material is coming out with time, but the underlying uh, industrial hygiene, it's a field not well understood, but the underlying premises of industrial hygiene have been in place since 1950, which is engineering controls. Um, this is some of the most compelling testimony that I think this committee has heard, and Mr. Petty, we thank you. Um, Representative Blazek, would you work with, or perhaps you can just get your resume to the committee so that if we have any further questions, we can reach out to you independently, is that okay? Absolutely, I provided it to almost 100 uh, litigation uh, in the United States already, so I'd be glad to do that. Thank okay. you for the time. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And as always, guys, huge appreciation for the people who support me through PayPal and Patreon. Uh, keeps me analyzing, getting the data out there. You know, more correct interpretations without kind of corporate or media bias. So really appreciate that. And anyone who can continue to support, that's huge for me. And of course, new people coming across my material, maybe consider so if you have the means. Uh, greatly appreciated. So thank you.